in the rest of the company's eyes. You ought to know that. You ought to use that information uh, to build political capital um, for IT's executive management so that they can have the influence that they need at critical periods in the future to make sure that the company's best interests are served uh, by what IT can do for it. Um, the, let's ask the question on the other side of that, though. What if you measure um, the actual return that you get from the project and it falls below what was projected? Um, why is that a good thing to know, then? Uh, well, certainly at that point, uh, there is the possibility that IT's credibility could be in some degree undermined and that that political capital could be eroded uh, and that IT's ability to function as a key influential player in the company's future could be in some ways diminished. Um, however, responsible executives figure out when things are not going as they thought they would go and figure out what to do to fix them. And so a post-project audit that reveals um, that the reality falls somewhat short of the projection, um, we can now go back and figure out, well, where did we mess up? Where did we make our mistakes? And how do we correct those mistakes so that we don't make those same mistakes again in the future? By going through that process, even in a visible way, such that it's visible to the rest of the company, that process all by itself will help to bolster the credibility of IT. The absolute worst thing that you could do is try and sweep it under the rug and pretend we don't have a problem, pretend we didn't fall short of the projection, hope everybody will forget about this, because really they won't. Um, and, and then it's going to look like not only does IT not deliver, uh, but they don't know how to function in a proactive way to identify and fix problems. And that is probably the most damaging thing that could happen in undermining the credibility of a CIO uh, and his staff. Uh, so doing a post-project audit needs to be part of what you're going to be doing when you do a return on investment analysis. So we talked about this. ROI produces the business justification to fund an IT project. No responsible CFO can allow you to proceed without one. See, this, it's not a matter of the CFO's being a bad guy and we've got to tell him a story so that he'll let us have the money that we need to fund IT and allow IT to continue to live in a manner to which it has been accustomed in the past. That is not what's going on here. Um, the CFO is responsible for the profitability of the company. That's, that is the primary metric of the CFO's success. Um, the CFO is the one that has to make the decision whether or not this money should be invested in this project or the next project or no project at all. Um, the CFO needs the information to make an informed decision. Uh, and the stockholders, the board of directors, the CEO, the other CXOs in the company, other CFOs in other companies, um, all these people will be wondering why the CFO is not proceeding in a rational way um, if the CFO doesn't have um, fairly thorough ROI analyses upon which to make his or her decision. Uh, so it's a non-negotiable requirement in the professional responsibilities of most CFOs. They've got to have ROI analyses, um, at least for the major funding decisions. And an IT project competes with other corporate projects for limited funding. Without an ROI analysis, there's no rational basis for comparison. So just in the same way um, that you never have enough money to do all the different things that you want to do in a given month, um, I mean, you'd always like to buy a new car, or add to the house, go on a vacation, um, whatever your dream lists are, and there's always not enough money to do everything you wished you could do in your personal life. Well, the same is true in a corporate life. 
the COO has a whole set of projects that she would like to get funded. The CMO has new marketing campaigns that he would like to get funded. Uh, the VP of sales has new sales strategies and programs and, and uh, efforts and incentives uh, that he would like to get funded. Um, and on and on it goes around the company. And by the time you add all that up, um, the, the desire is for far more money for new projects than is available. The CFO knows what's available, and so the CFO has to now prioritize these requests for funding from all the different um, departments around the, the corporation. And um, uh, certainly politics plays a role in that, but there uh, is a strong, rational, fiscal basis for those decisions also. Uh, and the ROI analyses from all different parts of the company help provide the CFO with that information. But it's important to realize that when IT is doing an ROI analysis that they're competing for funding. Uh, it's not just a matter of is this project going to come in above the hurdle rate? And if it does, therefore, we get it funded. Uh, but a lot of times, it's how far above the hurdle rate did this one come compared to the other projects that are looking for funding uh, from other parts of the company. So we see that um, all CIOs must be able to produce credible ROI analyses. Now, the CIO himself or herself is not the one producing the ROI analysis, of course. Um, the CIO is going to task uh, somebody subordinate to him or her to do that ROI analysis. And then, of course, that CIO wants to review it, may want to have input into it, may want to tweak it uh, once uh, that study is on his or her desk. But um, the CIO himself or herself is not really the one doing the, the analysis. So who is? Ah, you are, very likely. I mean, if you work for a CIO, sooner or later, you'll be part of a team putting together an ROI analysis for a new IT project. So all IT directors of larger companies must be able to produce credible ROI analyses. Um, and everybody who wants to be one of those folks, an IT director or a CIO, needs to know how to do these things. And so we address them here in this course. Um, we introduce the concepts, we go through a little exercise to help you understand the kinds of thinking that goes into an ROI analysis, but again, um, after having completed uh, this part of the course on ROI analysis, uh, you would have to then acquaint yourself with whatever the methodologies and policies are for your individual corporations, um, whatever the company is you work for, whatever they the way they do this and, uh, and become skilled in that methodology. Um, so we see that ROI analyses are pushed all the way down to the project manager level in most IT departments. So we then recognize that being good at producing ROI analyses is a cultivated skill uh, by IT professionals. And IT professionals, if they aren't responsible for producing the analysis, certainly uh, if they're in IT very long, will have opportunity to participate as part of the team putting together these studies. IT professionals need to speak the language of ROI. Uh, what does that mean? Well, if, uh, if we're talking about the internal rate of return for a project, you need to know what that means. That, that's got to not be a foreign, foreign term, and we will define that here in the lecture. Uh, you certainly need to understand intangible benefits versus tangible benefits. How to define those, um, how to tell which one's which. Uh, you, you need to have some definition of what we mean when we say ROI analysis. There are various and sundry different equations and methodologies for computing ROI. Uh, and there's a, there's a whole set of vocabulary that goes along uh, with doing ROI analyses, and we're going to talk about a lot of that in the next uh, hour and a half of these.